Scorn. 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 Super Saturday, the greatest day of rugby of the year, any year, is just one day, just a few hours away now. And in order to preview this, in order to dive into this, we went to the brand new Squidge Rugby studio that we have now and decided to dig into all six teams in some detail and preview all three games. Here we go. Do you know who's won the most wooden spoons in the history of the tournament? Oh, it'll, it'll be from the Five Nations or something before Italy were in it, right? Do you know who it is? Scotland. Ireland. Ireland. Ireland still hold the record. So if Wales come this weekend, really they're doing a solid in just keeping uh, the bottom of the table on average. <laughs> you know, on aggregate. Yeah. Them. yeah. yeah. You know. And now that Italy are good, that's them just trying to like fend that off. Exactly. The re wooden spoon record. If they can change it so they only get one every couple of years rather than every single year, yeah. that'd be great. And Unless Wales are the recipients. But I think what we're seeing this week, right, is it's the start of a really exciting year for the Six Nations where it isn't written in sand who finishes last. As a Wales fan, it hasn't had that much jeopardy because you've known you're going to be Italy most years. Yeah. And suddenly, that's up in the air. Suddenly, that's very different. Suddenly, we're heading to an era, right, in which anyone can beat anyone other than Italy can't quite beat Ireland yet, but I feel Italy can beat anyone else in this tournament. I feel anyone else can kind of beat each other. So we, in our time watching Wales yeah. as supporters, don't know what it f feels like to win a wooden spoon, to win, to <laughs> no. get a wooden spoon. Oh, no, like, I, I know what it feels like. I can imagine what it feels yeah, like. Yeah, but we've, we've not Georgia, experienced lost to Italy. that, yeah. is my point. Yeah, yeah. So w there was that one year where Scotland got it, and there yeah. was that one year where France weirdly got it, and it was really funny. But otherwise, I don't think we've really experienced many Italy not finishing bottoms because sometimes they've won one game and then it's gone, oh, but they won a game. Like, yeah. they should be off the bottom spot, but... Here we are. So I got asked by someone notable who may come up over the course of this video um, before the Six Nations what my prediction for it was. And I didn't have a hard feeling. I kind of said Ireland to probably win it. But, you know, my big gut feeling was every team will win a game and every team will lose a game. I felt there won't be a Grand Slam and there won't be a team that finishes bottom with zero wins. Yeah. I feel less confident in that now. <laughs> I think it's important not to get dragged into the whole our oh, Wales are the worst team in the world, the the worst thing to ever happen, the rugby's over kind of thing. But at the same time, there is only so far you can drag the whole it's a rebuilding team. Yeah. They've got to you know, they've they have got to actually build at some point rather yeah. than just accept that we've had something knocked down and we've got all these bricks. Which is the really interesting thing, I think, about last week, again about the France game. Yeah. I felt more confident about that France game than I do this Italy game as a Wales fan. Yeah. Um, but the interesting part of that was I felt that France game was the most where they've looked like they're building towards something. It's the most I've looked and gone like, oh, that's the thing. That's the thing they're building towards. That's the finished picture. It's the most encouraged I've been by Wales, this whole Six Nations. Yeah. Because it's daft because like you look at social media and everyone's talking about, oh, Sam Costello missed a kick and... Yeah. Missed a 1v1 tackle where Guy Fiku beat him when he was stitched up, essentially, yeah. on the end of an overlap. That was the best that anyone's ran the Welsh attack, including Costello, yeah. all, all this whole time. Watkin outside him really helped. That try that was set up for Thomas Williams was excellent, where Watkin stepped in, did some of the playmaking. Yeah. So I wanted to talk about the centres a bit, because I okay. think the really interesting call that Warren Gatlin's made in this team to play Italy is that they've brought back in Nick Tompkins at 12 and George North at 13 yeah. to partner Sam Costello, right? Yeah. This is George North's last game for Wales, so he deserves a start. He deserves a final run out completely, 100%. But I don't think this is Wales' best team that's playing. I and you remember what happened two years ago when Wales picked a sentimental team with Alan Wynne-Jones and breaking the world record and Dan Bigger winning his 100th cap. And they made the whole day about like celebrating these two legends. And then we couldn't because Ange Kapowutso was invited to the party. I worry what we're going to see is the same thing, where they spend the time celebrating George North and... Uh, because in Owen Watkin and Joe Roberts, Wales kind of found the foils I think Sam Costello's been missing this yeah. entire time. So, for me, the best rugby that Sam Costello's played in his career, right, was for the under-20s when he had Naira Owen at 12, a very sensible 12 who is a big carrier, but can also call a shape and a call attack and is a very organised, smart, intelligent player. And then, right, at points, at points he's had, at the Scarlets, it's worked with, you know, John Davis, with Scott Williams, and to some degree with Johnny Williams, who I yeah. think provides him with a few of the tools he needs to be... And the few occasions where, like, Johan Lloyd's played fullback 
That's yeah. kind of like a second play. I don't even think then. So I've watched I watched those games back for the Wales 10 video, and I don't think they really did anything together. Okay. Ewan Lloyd wasn't calling shape at fullback. Mm. What cost, when Costello's work best, right? Because he loves to involve himself in the game. It's when he's got a 12 who will take over and run the game with it. But he also works best when he's got a big carrying 12 that he can drop the ball off to because he likes to try and take stuff on himself. And it's that kind of... You remember how much better Reese Priestman was when he had Jamie Roberts alongside him? Sure, right? sure. There's that kind of vibe. Yeah. So he kind of... Sam Casella works best, plays his best rugby, when he's got a really specific kind of 12 with him, right? And Owen Watkin, this season, I think, has been the form player in Wales for me. And I thought he was absolutely brilliant in that game. And I thought Joe Roberts has been also in fantastic form for the Scarlets, which is not a sense you can say about many people. He yeah. really stepped up, Joe Roberts. Yeah, I think so. And showed that he wasn't afraid to get involved in yeah. sort of the playmaking stuff. It sounds like a bullshit point, but I think it helps that those three players are all, like, either similar in age or in kind of times of like... Or in terms of, like, international experience. Yeah, yeah. You know? Because, like, if you are Owen Watkin and you're thrown in and you're suddenly having to overrule Dan Bigger on how he calls an attacking shape, or vice versa, mm. you're Sam Costello and you're thrown in having to overrule George North all the yeah. time, it's a little bit more daunting. However, those three, I think they were on a really similar wavelength. Yeah. They work as a combination. Yeah. Right. In a way, I think Nick Tompkins and George North really worked with Dan Bigger. Nick Tompkins, ultimately, I think, is kind of a foil for someone, right? And you want Dan Bigger to be calling and organising that. And Nick Tompkins is a really good decoy option. He's really good at kind of threading those passes. He's a really, really good dummy runner. Um, that thing Rio Dyer said once, that he's really good at getting people to whack him. And he is. He's fantastic at that. And George North is a great strike runner off that. And those two do work together as a combo. But they work best when they've got a 10 like Dan Bigger, who's very authoritative. Yeah. Um, when they've got a 10 like Sam Costello, who likes to run things himself, I feel like it hasn't really been working. Mm. And it has been a bit of an issue. Gareth Anscombe is another player that's great for them because he's just very organised and very clean in how he runs a game. So, let's think about this, right? Mm. So, Sam Costello, attacking-wise, the shapes he was calling, had a great game against France. Yes. Right? Like, really good at knowing when they're on top and when they can afford to play wide rather yeah, than yeah. just overplaying, overforcing anything, right? So, let's say, right, Wales have gone away, had their team meeting and gone, Sam, that's brilliant, play it like this, okay? But this time you're going to have Nick and George as your centres instead. Do you think that changes the way Wales attack fundamentally? So, or do you think that's a positive? To have a look at this, right, we'll have a quick look at the Thomas Williams try Yeah, against France. Off a line-out on first phase, Wales go off the top, they spread a move wide to get Joe Roberts crashing over the game line. Just about, you know, one of those ornate kind of starter moves that just get the team flowing forward. They cross the game line. Sam Costello gets taken in a tackle, a Nick Tompkins style role, where he gets taken out in the background. And so, wraps onto the far side, having been involved in that move, comes Rio Dyer, who takes in, and he doesn't exactly call shape, but he acts as the fly half, right? So he's got options outside him. He calls the ball immediately to himself, and he takes the ball into contact. He allows it to be incredibly quick. He means that Thomas Williams isn't waiting for force to wrap around the corner, and he also means that he doesn't have to wait for someone else to take over, right? This is something that became a feature throughout this game that hadn't necessarily been throughout the others, where Rio Dyer is stepping in and playing 10. And he isn't a Shane Williams-type player who's necessarily making space for others, but he's carrying really well off 10, and he is providing passes. He's passing something that's come on a lot in the Six Nations, and not as many people talk about, but I think Dyer's been maybe Wales' best player, well, Wales' best back for me. Um, I think he's been absolutely brilliant. Wales can win, win it, but yeah. So, next phase, right, with Dyer having carried in himself, having got again over the game line, two phases up, Sam Casello's back up to his feet, calls for this forward pod, and they carry in, it's a quick ball, they're setting a better position, and it allows Costello to then flood out, and he calls a slightly shit shape. Except he hits exactly the right area, because he knows what he wants to do. He knows he wants to hit like a certain pod in the middle to carry in, so they've got a quick ball to play off in the middle with a more kind of restricted position. He wants to prevent the fold, tie in some French players on the far side of the ruck, split that defensive line so it's not, you know, one cohesive thing, which is where France are at the best, when they can really push up on you. And the moment the pass comes in, you can see Owen Watkin in the back here starts calling and organising the next shape, right? And he organises what's there, so it means Sam Cazot can just slide in and just slot in at 10 with the options already set around him. So he has the hard runners, Davith Jenkins being one, then Watkin out the back, he goes to Watkin out the back, Dav Jenkins picks a brilliant line, bodies his man, takes him out completely, and it allows Owen Watkin the time to look up. Tom and Ramos is drifting off because he's got so much space outside him because they've set the shape early enough. And he then carries in, 
makes the step, sees the, you know, man's been knocked off, breaks through, gives the pass inside to Thomas Williams, running that classic scrum half line. What's the, what, what would, if you were a commentator, what would you say about the line? Mm, I would say that there has never, ever, ever mm. been a good scrum half who doesn't run that line. I would say literally all, all of them. good scrum halves run that line. All of them. But also all good sevens. Have you noticed that about them? Yeah, all good rugby players run that line. All Chris Hashton is a, both of those. Would have run that line. Um, With that as well, the fact that Wales get Fiku out of the game yeah. straight away as the defensive organiser, Paul France, yeah, yeah. to leave Depo to leave Deportes stranded out there cap. on his first cap, making a 1v1 tackle with Owen Watkin in lots of space and Watkin dusts him off. Mm. It's a really well-constructed try because, as you say, Costello engineers that position where they can split up the two centres. Yeah. He's, that's clearly something he's targeted, is going, let's split these two up, let's, let's get one on 1v1 carries. Those kind of really hard runs to take out defenders very cynically that David Jenkins runs in this movie is the sort of thing where has been lacking. Yeah. It's a very extra thing. So the extra are very good at is sneakily and subtly taking out extra runners and taking out extra defenders and just not letting you realise why your defensive line is so disorganised. It just kind of is. Yeah. And David Jenkins has brought that to Wales really, really well. His running lines are superb. Say we've had a bid. Like Adam Beard's been really good this championship. Over the course of four phases, Wales have three different players call and organise the shape. This is the step forward they need to be making. If Wales want to be playing this multi-phase rugby chaos thing that Rob Howley keeps talking about and Warren Gatlin keeps talking about, right? It's been one of the in most interesting swings of the Six Nations. has been we've gone back towards phase play. We've gone back towards long passages of play to try and break down defences, which in the World Cup was not in vogue at all. If you went beyond five, maybe six phases, suddenly you're in trouble and defence was more likely to turn you over. Teams are trying that again now. They're trying to do you know, seven, eight, ten phases. And Gatlin said repeatedly that was something they really wanted to do against France because they felt they started getting with penalties then, or disorganising the way they did. And if that's going to work for Wales, they need multiple players calling those shapes. Nick Tompkins is not very good at this because he's used to working as a foil for Owen Farrell, for Alex Good, and for Dan Bigger. Yeah. Right? He's used to working with incredibly confident... And Gareth Anscombe. Tens, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's used to playing with tens who call their shape really Anscombe's well. Anscombe's arguably the, the best ten that he's played alongside. Yeah. The for 10 him. that brings the best yeah. out of him. Agreed, yeah. completely, yeah. Because constantly, Anscombe is managing absolutely everything because Anscombe, in the best way possible, is a control freak, but an attacking control freak yeah, yeah. in the way that Bigger is very much just like, I will send this downfield, and if you want to argue with me, then <laughs> give it a good go. Yeah. But, yeah, Anscombe, however, constantly, like, Nick Tompkins would take shit ball off him all day and he's completely happy with it. I think what Sam Costello needs isn't a foil, but a partner. Yeah. And I think what can provide him that. He's the closest we've seen so far yeah. to that. Yeah. And there's a few like Brim Bradley, I think, in the 20s. There's a few coming through. Kieran Williams is the greatest player that's ever played the game. <laughs> so there's a few options. Do not call Kieran Williams a game manager. Come he's on. He's the greatest player that's ever played the game. Oh, I'm not arguing with that. Literally everything. Um, Other than kick. <laughs> but the thing I worry about, right, is Wales have gone back to a completely unbalanced team. And this is not a side in the way we saw like, in that France game that know how to close out and manage games and not to the extent that Italy do. Yeah. So if you're Italy, what's your number one point of target against Wales? What's your number one thing that you're writing on your team team dressing room whiteboard, I guess, yeah. that you're saying, this is what we absolutely have to do specifically to target Wales? I think the most important thing, right, is that they just keep putting points on the board, right? Even if Wales come out and score three tries early, you want to be just kicking those three pointers or taking chances when you can because I don't think Wales have looked very good in the last 20 minutes, yeah. right? In any game. The game management has looked poor in the final stages, and they have a really, really inexperienced bench. The bench, I think, is a really important thing we need to come on to. Yeah. So the front row that's on the bench yeah. have two caps between them for Wales. Yeah. One of them was Evan Lloyd last week. The other one was Kemsley Matthias in the World Cup warm-up against England. Mm. Um, and then they've got Harry O'Connor uncapped on the bench, who let's face it, doesn't have that much experience even at club level for the yeah. Scarlets. Like, um, and good luck to them. You know, yeah. We physically don't know at this point how good a front row that is because it's so inexperienced. We've got an idea from having watched them play but for the my, Scarlets. My point is, like, anyway, but yeah. we've seen so little of them yeah. that we don't know how they're going to fare at international level. On the flip side of that, you have... At number 17 Mate. for Italy, the Mate. number one player that I looked to on the team sheet when it was named in Mirko Spaniolo. The greatest rugby player since Kieran Williams. He just loves scrums. He does love he's scrums. He's so into scrums. The fact he's that so he's excited about scrums. He's getting subbed on 
like in his first few caps for Italy, as the underdog team and going, right, okay, your opposite number today is um, Tyg Furlong, <laughs> is Dan Cole, is Weenie Antonio. And every time he's going, yeah, cool, okay, so what do you want me to do? Lift him up and take him over there? Uh, he's so good. I can't be- uh, genuinely... I'm lost for words at how good this guy is. Mm. And like, it's not like he's only a scrummager. Yeah, like, around yeah. the park, he's just a really good carrier. And he's getting through so much work. On one hand, you can't drop Danilo Fischetti because sure. he's so yeah. good and he's still on unbelievable form. Uh, he's one of the best breakdown threats of a front rower in the world. Mm. You can't really drop him. But for the half hour, 20 minutes or so that you get out of Spaniolo, that is a potential match winner right there. I'm really excited about what Spaniolo becomes in two years' time. He's right. the Italian ox. Yeah. You give him a couple of years, and suddenly that's a debate as to, depending on the game, depending on what the opposition brings, do you want the robust scrummaging, but brilliant around the park of Fischetti, or do you want to start Spaniolo and target the scrum? Yeah. Right? And then have, you know, robust stuff around the park. Or do you want to go the other way around? Because the other one can come off 20 minutes and you can target that, right? And it feels set up perfectly if they can really target the scrum in the last 20 minutes. They can get some proper dominance there. And Johan Lloyd had some difficulties managing that game against France. He came on, he kept chucking around his own 22. He didn't kick when it was on repeatedly. He thought there was a lot of very poor decisions he made. I don't think there's anyone in the Italian team from a game management point of view who's going to do that. I thought Stephen Vaughan had one of the best games for off the bench against Scotland. I thought the kind of zip he got into the game and the way he managed to completely change the picture that Scotland were responding to. Because Pajarello, I thought, has been fantastic in these last couple of games. He's really controlled things. He's given them a more sensible approach. Starting Varney feels like a risk to me because I think Pajarello has been so good. And then what that allowed him to do was Varney to come on and change the picture. I want to talk about this. Yeah. That's, for me, really important. Mm. So Italy's bench says to me that they expect to be in a tight game. Yeah. That they expect this to be a really close game. And so they can bring on Pajrello with 20 minutes to go when their scrum presumably starts to dominate, starts Mm. to get on top, and he can start playing the corners. He can get them out of their own half if necessary. Mm. Like some of the kicks he was putting against Scotland, there was the one that he put in where Scotland had to catch it on the very touchline and had to backpedal 20 odd metres to actually retrieve the ball and end up surrendering it in the end. Like Pajarello's kicking so far this tournament, he has been the man at nine for Italy. Casada has been very upfront and he wants to give all three of them a start, but I think Pajarello in terms of his game management, his kicking game, and the shape that they've had generally Mm. has been the best. And so if he has a dominant platform in front of him by the end of the game, that's going to make up for itself if Varney's already been playing at tempo for the first 60 minutes. But that's the thing I'd wonder, right? Do you want the more lively scrum off playing during the period where it might be loose if you've got a dominant pack? It's a win-win situation, is the thing. Yeah, but that's the thing. The other change of note is Ange Kapowutso, the guy who created the try last time to win in the Principality, drops out, and in comes Lorenzo Pani, yeah. who is a fantastic player, and in some ways, maybe complements the weaknesses in this Italian team better. Agreed, agreed. It's really annoying because around different parts of the tournament, mm. I've been kind of going like, do you start Pani over Capuazzo? Because he's not as good attacking-wise. Yeah. He's not as quick. He doesn't hit lines as well. But his kicking game is so much better. Yeah. He gets... I would have genuinely said about twice as much length on his kicks. And if you look at this team, this is a team of players who are composed and play together every week at Benetton where they win the majority of their games. And that massive injection of cash that the Italian Rugby Federation and other sources have put into Benetton is really paying off because most of this team play together. And since losing Garbisi two, three years ago, since he left, they kind of went, ah, oh, shit, okay. Let's keep the rest of this team together, put all our money in this basket, and they've become a really solid team who know how to win together, right? Where most of this Wales team play for Cardiff or the Scarlets, where they've won, what are we looking at? I think Cardiff won three games this season and Scarlet won two. Yeah, and additionally, they are introducing more and more game management options into that yeah, back line. Yeah, yeah. We've spoken about Pajarello. Brex has taken on quite a lot himself. Parney has the capabilities to do that in future, even if not at the moment. Yeah. Lewis Liner's a really good kicking option who has called shapes in past the Harlequins that 
basically, with the exception of Manoncello and uh, Ioani, who are both like extreme running threats, mm. who, if given any space, are ludicrous. That whole back line is just full of players who are willing to call shapes. Yeah. And their whole forward pack are full of ballers now. So this, it's constant ball handlers. It's a really difficult team to play against. Yeah, This is the thing I think Quasada has brought to this team, right? Is they seem to have a genuine belief in themselves. Italy expects to win on Saturday. Yeah, and they should. Not hope to win they like should. two years ago. They expect to win. Which was a problem last year, right? Yeah. They went into that game and they went behind to that kind of lucky jammy try for Rio Dyer early on. Some of those have got very good at scoring. You know, those seem to keep coming up. And then Liam Williams scores, you know, a well-constructed try shortly afterwards. The moment they go behind it, they get more and more frustrated. And you've seen that Six Nations documentary, right? There's the really enlightening, I think it's the highlight of the documentary, is that episode on that game, where Kieran Crowley completely loses his head and is screaming at the referee, has a go at him at halftime, and in the changing rooms, he's just saying, like, we're being screwed over by this referee, we've got no chance here. With, you know, rather than talking about how yeah. how do we get some decisions, the this. messages that he's getting onto the pitch are complain to the referee, Michaeli. Quesada will not do that. If this is a tight game and our decision goes against Italy, the messages will all be around how do we correct and make sure we're not in that situation. Yeah, what are we doing? What can we do yeah. better? So, um, I think Italy should go in as favourites for me. I think so. I think they're the mature team, they are further along in their rebuild. And Agreed. Wales do not look like they understand how to win a game. Agreed. I think if Wales are going to win it, they're going to win it in the first half. Yeah. Um, and that's why I think if Italy can just stick in it for the first half, if they are within 10 points with 20 minutes to go, I think they win this game. Yeah, with that pack they've got on the bench, yeah. I completely see that. With as well, like Ross Vincent to come off the bench will yeah. bring loads of impact, will be really energetic. I just, I. I feel like Wales need to get out to a big lead early if they're going to win it. Definitely. They need to kind of blow them over early doors and then hold on. Yeah. Uh, or potentially hope to break their spirit. But we haven't seen that happen. Like even the game in Ireland, right? If they kept fighting all the way through, and yeah, they scored two tries really late on, but that is a fairly impressive performance to say they didn't end the 22 once in the second half. Yeah. The opposition 22, right? I've seen a few people make the point that is this the game with the most jeopardy on it? I don't think losing changes that much for Wales. I think this Six Nations has been entirely about the performances, not to the, the thing Steve Hansen kept saying when he was in charge of Wales, right? It was he didn't care about results, he only cared about performances. Um, I think this year, this Six Nations is a performance-based thing for Wales. And then this, my feeling is in the summer, that's when the rebuild really starts. And that's when you start really moving on. Now these players have got some experience under their gut and they can start to play a team that is fairly evenly matched to them and try and kick on and attack that. And hopefully we've got a few of the, you know, Jack Morgan and Dewey Lakes of the world back, maybe Gareth fans come even, um, which allows you to build a bit towards what this team can become. The last word on Wales is be patient, basically. <laughs> yeah. Be patient, because it might happen, it might not, but the only way we'll find out is by persisting with it. Yeah, yeah. Because what, what better option have we got? <laughs> so... Second game of the day, Ireland head to Ireland where they will find <laughs> Scotland are waiting for them at the stadium to play a game. Mind games. Oh, mate, they can't wait for this. So they're not going for the Grand Slam, as may have been hoped. And I think many people bought their tickets even before the tournament, expecting they'd be heading for. Um, I kept saying to you all the time in the office, England are going to beat Ireland, and I didn't have the balls to say it publicly because I thought <laughs> someone would go like, this age is well, this age well, way, when they didn't. Um, but here I am now. I do not get the same feeling out of this game that this is the game where Ireland slip up. Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? Like, you look at Scotland in the Calcutta Cup game against England, yeah. and you go, oh, these guys are unstoppable. Oh, one of these guys at least is unstoppable in Duan. Um, <laughs> but that feels like such a long time ago now that the Italy <laughs> does, game's yeah. happened. But once again, broken record and all that, I don't look at Scotland losing to Italy and go, oh, this is the end, this is dreadful, this is the worst thing ever. Because Scotland weren't that bad, no. I don't think. Um, but on the, on the other hand, like Ireland are in a similar situation, having just lost to England. Both of them haven't gone into the previous game as favourites have lost but not played terribly, which is a we really weird one to reflect on. I don't think the loss at Twickenham should affect Ireland much. 
and I don't think it says anything big about there's a problem with Ireland or whatever. I don't think Ireland was shit. At no, I agree. Right. And I think people have come to that conclusion because they lost and because they were worse than they If Marcus Smith misses that drop goal, everyone's going like, oh, Ireland brilliant to manage that, to yeah, exactly. close out like a t really tight right. game. Their opposition played their best game at home in maybe five years. Yeah. In a number of years anyway. It right? would have been funny if Marcus Smith missed that drop goal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We had penalty advantage. So they, eventually they lose it in an 81st minute drop goal. They were ahead at half time, having been steamrolled, having barely had any time to get in position to score points. They were ahead on 80 minutes. Despite this, this is the best team or the second best team in the world, depending on, you know, them and South Africa are the two best teams in the world. They're one and two, it's, yeah. and it's hard to separate them. But they're that for a reason, you know, because even when they're outplayed, they are in the game and they are ahead at 80 minutes. There has been one game in what we're looking at, two or so years, where they have been genuinely outplayed since the team kind of clicked, which was that one game away in New Zealand, that first test, they weren't right, things didn't work at all, their defence got caught out, and it took Andy Farrell six days to fix that problem, turn it around, and turn it into a honking New Zealand. They were backed up. Probably it's late. very true, because I've kind of like made the assumption mm. there that you need to lose to fix things, whereas Andy Farrell isn't that. No. Like if, if there's one thing Andy Farrell is not, it's complacent. Yeah. You know, he will have come away from 36 mil win against Italy and gone, that was shit, lads. Yeah. Or something like that. With that in mind, probably neither team was going to be too affected by the fact that they've just come off yeah, a yeah. Di really disappointing loss. So the interesting thing in team selection, right? Ireland have gone for Nunchies 15. They've made some changes on the bench. Scotland have made two changes. They've brought back in Ben White, who is the best box-kicking nine they have. Yeah, he's been and excellent all tournament as well. He really has. And they've brought in... At 12, Stafford McDowell. Yes. Now, I think there's a lot of people who's only got one cap who perhaps haven't watched much of Glasgow and don't know much about Stafford McDowell. So he's their club captain, first he's and foremost? Club captain. And he has started all but two games of them this season. He's played all but one. Uh, they had one game off the bench. Meaning, right, the Hugh Plotty combo, right, have only started two games together all season because Stafford McDowell has been keeping them out of the team. He has been fantastic for Glasgow, right? He is, similar to what I was saying about Watkin, but I think he's been maybe the form player at Glasgow, maybe at the Scottish clubs in general for me this season. So he's a kind of bigger, like, boshier centre. Yeah. He's probably much closer to, to a Pilotu than Redpath is in that he is a big ball carrier. He's a big, big lad. Defensively so solid as well yeah. that not much is going to get through him and Jones as a centre combo. Yeah. That potentially, I assume, that's all part of the rationale for selecting him over Redpath yeah, is that yeah. he's a little bit more heavyweight that he's going to bring you a lot more in defence and leadership in D as well. Yeah. Even though he's only got one cap, he's not going to be a fish out of water, is he? Yeah. He's in really good form. You know, he's scored three tries in the last two games. He's been playing really well all season as they're keeping, you know, the regular national team starters at the team. But, right, the thing I think he adds is a kicking game. Is he is a fantastic kind of sneaky kicker of the ball. He's not a frontline kicker who's necessarily sending long kicks and ruining the tactical kicking game but he does a lot of kind of sneaking kicks through in the wide channels, of sliding stuff through, and of kind of attacking grubbers. He's really, Similar really to Tupolotu. Similar to Tupolotu. I think even more emphasised than that, it's something that's really come on in this game, I think, in the last year or so. For me, if, you know, I haven't seen every game he's played for Glasgow, but it's the thing that's really stood out to me is how good his kicking game's become and how they've really lent into that under Franco Smith. They've really gone, OK, we've got a big centre who can kick, we've got you know good kickers throughout this team, and we can use that in order to build an attacking game. And obviously their, their maul is brilliant as well, and using that kicking game to get them into position to use their set piece has been a huge, huge part of their game. He is something slightly different. He's probably not a player Ireland has spent much of the week analysing and looking at, yet he's a player who can change the way they play. It's a really good point, actually, about the analysis they probably have spent all week looking at red path and yeah. going how can we get through him and that's completely changed the dynamic i think gregor townsend has really moved on from having the what you always said about alex dunbar sam johnson those centers who were just a foil for finn yeah that they would stand in and they would clean up his mess sort of thing whereas now there's a lot less mess that's coming out of finn they've gone right we want a Ball at 12. We want a proper mm. playmaker, someone who can kick, run, and throw long balls and manage and attack themselves. Yeah. We've spoken at length about the fact Tua Pilotu does that really well. 
Cam Redpath, of course, is also a 10 yeah. at Bath. Sometimes at club level when Finn's not playing. So he's more than capable of that. But it makes you think, as you say, that's potentially just a change of direction that they're trying to yeah. go in. That it's somebody who's extremely direct, as you say, has a kicking game and is more than capable of running an attack if need be. Yeah, yeah. Scotland could currently finish any opening first and fifth. Really? <laughs> Which is... Phenomenally Scottish. Do you know but how many points they need to be Ireland by to finish first? Oh, it's 40 odd. Okay. Um, it's like 30 or 40 points. I should have. Stafford checked. McDowell scoring but 40 points. You heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> I would, if I was a Scottish fan, be really excited about McDowell. I think it's an inspired change. A hell of a baptism of fire on your second cap, going straight up against Bundy, the best 12 in the world. I can pretty uncontroversial say. Best male 12 in the world. Best male 12 in the world. Um, but. The Irish attack is about so much more than just sending things through Bundy, yeah, is the yeah. thing. It is about being able to read several plays per second, essentially, that you can never really count somebody out of the attack. It's the most impressive thing about it is that every single player on their feet is a genuine option. You look at when these two teams played in the World Cup, the early try that James Lowe scored comes from Mac Hansen standing completely on the blind side, completely mm. out of the attack, on the other side of the ruck to where the break is eventually made. And he works all the way around, gets on the outside of Gary Ringrose, who manages to throw that dummy and get, get the ball to Hansen on the outside, who gets the touch and then feeds it onto James Lowe, right? And what really impressed me about Ireland in the Six Nations is I looked at that try originally and went, that's just Mac Hansen being brilliant. That's mm. just him having great vision. The fact that they've got a winger who's essentially also a fly half, obviously played fly half at younger levels. As we look at this Six Nations, Calvin Nash has come in and done maybe not necessarily just as good a job, but he's played a similar role. Yeah. Which he does at Munster. Yeah. Right. You watch Munster, and it's the thing that really stands out to me when I watch Munster this season is how good Calvin Nash is yeah. and how often he does that, how often he steps in and plays 10 and he manages shape and he allows those players around him. Same way we were talking about Watkin earlier, allows his 10 in, you know, um, ja Jungle Kong call? Jungle Kong. Jack Crowley. Jack Crowley. Him. Don't do to, that. Um, Johnny Wilkinson did it, so I can. Um, to <laughs> play his natural game, right, which engages defenders slightly more um, likewise, Joey Carberry, in the rare occasion he isn't injured, is also a kind of team who likes to engage defenders. Yeah. And it allows him to do that if they've got someone to back up and be able to call shape and set the attack without him. So this try that was scored by Dan Sheehan against Italy, mm. it's very much, a, pretty much exactly the same picture we've just talked about with Mac Hansen, mm. where he starts on the far side of the ruck to, to the side of the screen we're looking this from, mm. right? And at this stage... Varney in the defensive line, there is not a chance that he has factored in Calvin Nash as a player I need to mark. Yeah, yeah. He has probably got his head in a swivel, looking at what's in front of him, looking at what's happening near the breakdown. And as the ball gradually works out there, Hugo Keenan doesn't even look at him, just gets really good communication in his ear from Nash, who then hits that line, breaks the tackle of Varney, gets them on the front foot to eventually set up this disorganised line where Crowley manages to get the ball in behind and they set up that try for Sheehan. It's fantastic by Nash. As I say, he's just come straight in, gone, great, you want me to play the Matt Hansen role? And done it seamlessly. Yeah, and brilliantly. do I think that he's going to just overtake Hansen as the first choice for Ireland all the time? Not necessarily, but he's as good a second choice as you could possibly ask for. This is the one big criticism, the anti foul rate, right? That he isn't building enough depth. And yet, whenever he's had to, he's always found a play who fits the system perfectly yeah. and been able to build into that. And... It's the weird thing where they could have done with Calvin Nash being blooded beforehand, so he didn't need to do it here. Sure. But the thing is, it doesn't matter because he's come in and he's really quickly got up to speed. He's clearly really, really good, Andy Farrell, at bringing players up to speed on exactly what he wants from them. A lot of, the, a lot of it because the systems are simple. You just need to learn the playbook, know the playbook, and be able to respond quickly to situations that arise in front of them, right? In many ways, it's just complicating what you do at junior rugby rather than being a different game. Yeah, yeah. And these are all good rugby players. They're all yeah, smart yeah. rugby players because you have to be to get to that level. And as you say, like it's knowing the system well enough and being able to play off each other well enough. Yeah, yeah. And as well as that, Calvin Nash is a great finisher. Yeah. Uh, he's taken a couple of tries really, really well so far in the Six Nations. Um, defensively very sound and 
just really impressed by how he's gone so far. So we mentioned Scotland made a couple of changes in the 15. Ireland haven't, but they have made changes on the bench, right? So after going 6-2 the previous week and ended up getting caught out when they had a number of injuries in the back line, they have brought in on the bench Gary Ringrose and they have brought in on the bench Harry Byrne. Two more Leinster players because they didn't have enough of those already. When you sacrifice Frawley, I think you kind of need an extra back on the bench, but clearly in Harry Byrne, they want an alternative option to bring on for Crowley. Yeah. If they want to change the way that they're attacking, they want to up the tempo a little bit, then Harry Byrne does bring that. Mm. And as you say, Gary Ringrose, defensively, if they're in a tight game, nothing will really get through him. Not to say that's not already the case of Henshaw and Arkey, mm. but Gary Ringrose does genuinely bring something. But that bench feels made to go on and have an impact where the bench last time, the two backs anyway, felt there in case there was an injury. Yeah. Right? They were covering in case someone's blowing really hard and has to come off, someone's worked too hard, or someone has picked up an injury. Where this week's team feels like they've gone, okay, there will come a point where this game may feel more like a Conor Murray game. Yeah. Where this way Scotland are playing may suit us bringing on Harry Byrne, who's a slightly different player. England a few times were able to, because the way on kick chase, Ireland defend with their 13s really specific, and Robbie Henshaw is not as used to that as Gary Ringrose is. Yeah. And I think there's a decent chance Scotland, again, with Van der Merwe, look to exploit that. Uh, he's really good, by the way, John Van der Merwe. He's not bad. Yeah, good rugby player. Um, he's big and he's fast, yeah, just so you know. wouldn't argue. Um, blonde as well. The other, I think, interesting thing with them going for 5-3 this week, mm. when these two teams played in the World Cup, certainly in the first half when Scotland were in the game, yeah, yeah. Ireland did, in a way that kind of backfired on Italy last week, let Scotland run them a little bit early on. You know, they defended quite passively until they could slow the ball down. Mm. When the ball was slowed down, when they got a chance to actually disrupt a breakdown, as Ty Byrne does in this very clip here, yeah. Um, that is when they went, right, now let's get off the line. Now let's chase this. So the way they're doing that is much less likely to tire out your forwards early on. Mm. And obviously, it's not really much of an issue for Ireland because they've got an extremely fit and well-conditioned pack. But I don't think there'll be as much need to absolutely stack the bench full of yeah, yeah. forwards because they'll all be pretty fresh through the whole game, you'd imagine. Again, this could age very badly. Mm -hmm. but I think it's a huge ask to imagine Ireland when you know Ireland at home Six Nations on the line St. St. Patrick's Day weekend mm. it's a lot to imagine them crumbling and throwing the Six Nations away at yeah. this point and it won't be an occasion like last year where they were clearly incredibly nervous for the first 20 minutes I don't think winning is beyond Scotland by any stretch um, I think it's very possible but again if they do it it's because they disrupt it and they keep building throughout the course of the game Scotland always have the potential to just come out of the blocks and surprise you, mm. but it's always a pleasure to watch that Irish attack on the, at the same time. <laughs> so, yeah, it should be a really good game. And then finally, the game we've all been so excited for. I spent the entire Six Nations waiting for this one game, right? Um, France versus England. Sure. It's going to be rugby. It's going to take place. It's going to happen. There's going to be at least four players involved, and one of them... Right, it's going to be Gorge, Gorge Ford. Well, that's always the bit I most look forward to about yep. watching any rugby game, is watching George Ford. I think England last week set a template for how they're going to play, right? And I think they've been trying to do that all six nations. They've been trying to reach that performance. And I kind of felt like the moment England got that one game in the bag, they'll keep going back to it. Like, okay, so the analogy is, right, when I was in second year, I wrote one really good essay. My first draft of it was terrible. I went back, I rewrote it, and it was really good then afterwards. And every piece of work I did subsequently to that, both in my third year of uni, but then also like when I came to write the first few school trophy videos, I would come back and I'd look at that essay and I'd go like, oh, that's how I do it. That's the best way I can write an essay, right? I think England have been trying to do that. They've been like me in first year and in sixth form when I was writing loads of essays and they were fine and they were getting by and sometimes you know they'd win games and they'd get passing grades or I'd get even good grades out of them but broadly they weren't the thing they needed to be and I could tell that you could always tell that and I wrote one that was good and suddenly I could just refer back to that and go like oh god that was exactly what we needed to do so what you're saying is England have been trying to build a performance for a whole Six Nations. And eventually they've got to a point and they've read your essay from first year. And that's inspired them to be the number one team in the world. My 
uh, my essay. Yeah, yeah, it was good. It was good. You should and read it. Both has loved it. Yeah. <laughs> So I think that's what they've got, right? They've got the model in place that they can look at and go, okay, okay, this is it. I saw some people give Ugo Moni flack for saying English playlists every week. And he's like, yeah, they're trying to. I get that. <laughs> I get that completely. But also he's right in that I think they needed that one performance of it working for not quite 80 minutes, but it was around 70 minute performance maybe. They switched off for maybe 10 minutes, I then got back ahead, and then they found a way back in and they won from there. Right, and it says uh, Connor w Wibble Rugby, friend of the channel. Uh, one Legend. day we we'll hope to get him in on one of these. Um, he is superb, excellent, very good at his job. Uh, the point he made, right, staying in the fight is the most important thing for this England team. Just finding a way to be in the game as late on as possible, so they can put themselves in a situation to pull off the Marcus Smith win, to pull off that drop goal. And that's really important as well, is yeah. the axis. You're, I think you're about to get onto it. Yeah. The axis between George Ford and Marcus Smith. The fact that now, those are both genuine attacking threats and both genuine game-managing fly mm. halves. If you look at the way that Smith plays for Quinns week in, week out, it's no longer about the goose step. The goose step's still there. It's still good. It's mm. still in, in motion. It's still firing. But... It's all about his game management. It's all yeah. about his kicking game. It's all about, you know, like going for drop goals every now and then and uh, calling shapes in attack. And the other thing that's really interesting about that is if you told me at the start of the tournament that we're potentially looking at in the team of the tournament, your fullback is either Cam Winnett or George Furbank. Yeah. I would have laughed so hard considering oh, they literally have Tom R. Ramos and Hugo Keenan in this tournament. But... George Furbank's been excellent. He really has. Um, especially against Ireland. Against Scotland, it was an interesting one because it's back and forth because he would do something structurally that's really good and then he would just drop the ball cold and do on sure. the score yeah. off it. Like, as an actual rugby player in terms of his skill set, he's not as sharp as somebody like Stewart is. But in yeah. terms of like the way he reads the game, something like the Ireland game makes you realise, actually, he really complements both Ford and Smith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He works perfectly because he's got a bit more pace than Freddie Stewart. And we saw them use that really well in that opening try against Ireland. But he's also a former fly half, right, as we talked about, which gives him a very different kicking game and it gives him that ability to step in and be an alternate kind of playmaker. Equally, it may not be the case that George Furbank mm. is going to be their first choice fullback yeah. going forward. It might just be that they've gone, this is the way we want to play. We need to soften the rest of the team into this system yeah. by having George Furbank specifically do this. Okay, so Steve Borg in his time with... Leicester, right, had a really established game plan that was going very well. That second season was in charge, and they were on a long winning streak at the start of the season. I think it was maybe nine or ten games unbeaten. And then they got to the European Cup, and they were targeting the Premiership rather than Europe that season. I think Borthwick was on record as talking about this as though it's been the case. And they sent out a second string team, and they went away to Bordeaux, right? And they were basically not given a chance because Bordeaux had their full French team out. The, you know, the, the Jalabers of the world. Yeah, the Lucas. Kind of yeah. yeah. And they weren't given the chance. And what Borthwick did was he went, I'm not just going to change this team. I'm going to build a completely different second game plan in order to suit this team. And we're basically going to have the plan A and the plan B. And we're going to play this as a separate thing, right? And Leicester in that game broke the world record for most kicking meters by any team in the professional rugby match. And instead of kicking contestable and high, they kicked really long all the time, right? And I feel like what we saw when Furbank came in, was them to lean into that second approach, the approach they less are talking against Bordeaux, and they would then bring that game out sometimes. You know, depending on the opposition, they had a second game plan they could go to, and they could, again, similar to what I was saying, they could point to that Bordeaux game and go, this is the model. This is what we tried to do. It really worked against Bordeaux. We kicked for meters, we kicked long, and we played very differently. And then they can lean on that game, and they can go, okay, look, we're playing Bordeaux-style rugby here, or the Bordeaux games rugby here, rather than plan a that's the and essay that's the old second year essay exactly. right there exactly also it worked um, in the world cup kicking yeah. along yeah and it got them really good results yeah so and i think that's the interesting thing right we're now in this stage where i think borthwick against scotland tried to develop a different game plan try to twist things slightly and we're seeing this start to build and i wonder if this is the perfect game against a France team playing as they are where they're kicking so much less than they did in the past. As yeah. I say, phase play rugby is coming back into the vogue seemingly. And France have gone like, yeah, c'est à la mode, c'est bon. And oui. 
they have gone, we're going to keep hold of the hecking ball. Yeah. As they say in France, that's a French swear word. <laughs> yeah, it's one of Sean um, Edwards' favourite French words. <laughs> yeah, he loves it. Um, it sounds like a town somewhere in Warwickshire. L'opportunité, say hecking a norm. <laughs> For me, right, how England are going to play if it was decided by whether Furbank or Stewart is starting at fullback, mm. or Marcus Smith in the World Cup as well. I feel they've kind of got different game plans depending on their fullback. And the fullback is kind of the giveaway of how England are going to play. Yeah. And I feel they're going to play that kind of much quicker looking to counter-attack and looking to play, yeah, faster rugby with Furbank at 15. On the flip side of what you were just saying, mm. I think it's really interesting what you're saying about phase play and yeah. that teams are more likely to go through that. Because the difficulty with France is... They've not been able to move forward in the first place. Yeah. And once France gets some front football, they are literally unstoppable. You know, you looked at the game against Ireland where they weren't really in it. They hadn't really moved forward at all. Ireland really got to Luku. Then suddenly they moved forward once and Damien and Penno scores yeah. on the stroke of half time. And then you look at it against Wales, more importantly, as soon as they found an opportunity where they could actually build a platform, they are ripping Wales to shreds. So much of that is their bench coming on because their yes. bench were bloody massive. But equally, like, even before that, yeah. you know, you would find moments where, like, Biel Biarre makes a break down the wing, and suddenly their actual broken field attack is so unbelievably good. Yeah. And there were moments against Italy where you saw that, but, for example, Fika's try against Wales, mm. right? You look at their setup; they've got a pod of just two in midfield. In theory, this should be quite easy to defend. Ramos isn't really a threat on the inside. It's not like it looks like it's going to come off him and then he moves it out to the back. No, it goes to Olivon, who ships it out the back to Ramos. Deporter sees nice and early, like, I can make a gap here. So he runs up, he takes a man out of the game. I think it's Watkin takes out the game. Um, Ramos can then ship it, gives Ficker a one-on-one -on -one with the try line in sight. Mm. It's so, so simple, the way that they can just forge an attacking game off nothing. Yeah. However, as you say, the bench was such an important impact. You look at Malvaca coming on for the last 20 minutes. Weirdly, it's vindicated the fact that Marchand was always the starter before the World Cup with yeah, Malvaca on yeah. the bench. And Movaka, for me, is a better rugby player. But maybe that is the way around that you play it going I forward. So. I think it's a Malcolm Mark situation. Yeah. Where he's better, but he's best used in the last 20 minutes. Yeah. That's because you look at the situation. Like he's him, the best player in the world. But. Indeed. Indeed. But you're looking like picking and going around the breakdown to against tired Welsh forwards, mm. maybe catching them offside or getting an extra couple of post-contact metres. Really difficult to stop. Talfi Fenua, much the same. Gareth Davis, having just come onto the field, puts in a fairly rusty looking kick. Yeah. Tal Fifnil charges it down through A, being fresh, able to work onto that side, and B, being bloody massive, Yeah. really helps. However, I think the French pack being so physical and so physically dominant, so well conditioned and so powerful was huge against Wales and completely just overwhelmed Wales in a stage where perhaps the game management wasn't what it was and it was starting to drop off, much like the thing on the wall just there, <laughs> fell off the wall as we were recording. That won't happen to England. Yeah. England have an enormous pack themselves. Given you've already got Chesham starting in the back yeah. row. Who was brilliant last week. So good. Hasn't come up much. Like, not many people have been talking about it. He was so good at six. Yeah. And obviously, he just played it as an extra second yeah. row forward. But it's not like the stuff that you absolutely, like, non-negotiably need a back row to be doing. It's not like he slacked on those at all. Yeah. He's incredibly physical. Him driving Bundy Arkey into touch and almost <laughs> ripping the ball off him. It's freakish. Fantastic. But he is the sort of player that would be really, really useful against France, against this French pack. Um, George Martin. He was so good last fantastic. week as well. And Atoje. A lot of people talk about Atoje not quite being at the peak of his powers or whatever. But I think the way he's playing has been really sneaky and really, really strong. I think he's been playing really well. The thing is, if you're not noticing Atoje, that is, that's the Achilles heel. Yeah. At that point, you know he's playing better. Yeah. You know he's doing something really sneakily behind the scenes, but off cameras, that you can't see that's pissing a nine off somewhere. I don't this in the video, right? But Felix Jones has basically come in and gone, you're even at Beth now. We want you defensively <laughs> to play the even at Beth role because we know you're one of about four players in the world that can do it as well yeah. as Ibn Etzebeth can. And he is. He is maybe not as well as Ibn Etzebeth, because Ibn sure. Etzebeth's top five players in the world. Yeah. But he's probably the best forward in the world, Etzebeth. Toje is top ten forwards in the world, and he is developing it He's the that closest level. that you can get yeah. to him. And also, so Felix really Jones said it's probably going to take between 12 and 18 games for this to click. Jacques Nineveh apparently said it would take 14, and it 
talk about affinity for them to click. That um, All Blacks game when they won and kind of turned World Rugby on its head very much sure. in a way we're still recovering from, that was game 14 of their reign. Right. right. Um, Felix Jones reckons it's going to take around that time. It's going to take them about the rest of this year. It's going to click sometime in the middle of next year. Um, maybe tail in the Six Nations next year or during the summer tour next year. But by that point, you know, they're up and running and they're building towards a World Cup in full capacity. What we're seeing is Atosha adapt to this role incredibly well and play it incredibly well. And Chesham and um, Martin are giving him options to them be incredibly physical around the rest of the pitch and make those big shots without him having to be the one to shoot up. Yeah, and as you say, it's not like there's any change when those no. guys are subbed off. I have a sneaky feeling about England again in this game. I feel like this is the start of something. And France's kind of World Cup heartbreak feels like it's over, but they've now gone into full-on revolution mode. It's a really difficult game to call because... I think it would be so typical of this England team if they back up the last one, yeah. particularly with the form Ben Earl's on. Like, a word, a word for him, because he's been world-class this Six Nations. Yeah. He's completely unstoppable. He's voiced his ambitions to be up there with, like, the Ali Savias of the world as, like, named as one of the best back rowers in the world. I think he's done that this Six Nations. Um, however, as I said, like, France looked like themselves last week, which yeah. is the biggest compliment you can give anybody. That... Tries like Maxime Lucu's one at the end, you know, are scored because France are bullshit, right? And all they need is a little bit of a front foot go forward ball. That was on first phase that they scored that. If France get any sort of front foot ball, then they're unstoppable. Yeah. But England seem to have picked the perfect pack to prevent that. Yeah. France's no. discipline has been poor this year. Yeah. And that is the thing they've got to target, right? It's really going after them for penalties. And the way Wales work, like Gatlin's been pretty up front now that the tactic in that game was to try and get France to concede penalties. And statistically, they looked into what are the situations in which France concede the most penalties and they picked a team and they picked a game plan devised around that, devised around getting France to give away penalties. It's really smart. Yeah. And it didn't quite come off, but for a long time it did until Wales started putting themselves under more pressure and conceding those penalties themselves. And we don't uh, really know. I mean, Borthwick I, definitely does, but we don't really know whether this is the England team to do that, I which think I think we're going to learn. I think it is. And I think England have two sets of halfbacks who know how to execute that, right? Well, Wales only had one. Yeah. And that will allow them to keep that pressure for 80 minutes without any decisions slipping and without the pressure slipping. And yet they allow themselves to change the game by bringing... It's a good point with Danny Kerr as well. Yeah. The fact that, yeah, he will raise the tempo, but play in the right areas. Yeah. And... Yeah, you're going to catch someone offside. The, the speed you're going to play out with yeah. Karen Smith there. Like, yeah, no problem. I recognise we talked almost exclusively about England rather than France. Mm. But I kind of don't know what this France team are. They feel like a kind of free-falling, weaker version of the France team they've been over the last few years. And they feel like the team that should have arrived in between the 2019 team and the 2020 team. Sure. Right? They, they should have transitioned through this side into that one. Instead, they arrived kind of fully formed and it was like, oh, they're brilliant. We love them. They might lose the old game like they did against Scotland up in Murrayfield. But hey, they're great. They're great fun. We all love them. Antoine Dupont, isn't he a funny little fella? And instead, what we got is that team then building and then eventually not achieving the thing they're building towards. And now they're in this state of existential crisis where they've kind of gone back to the start of that rebuild and are now doing it now. And maybe this in the long run leads to them building something more. It makes you realise four years is a long time. It really is. It really is. I think, again, France starts favourites, but I think England have picked the team and I imagine a game plan based on everything we know about Borthwick, based on last week and based on the 15 they've selected and the 23 they've selected to potentially cause an upset here. And the thing is, right, if Scotland sneak past Ireland and England win this, England win the championship. Oh, my God. Oh, my Imagine God. Imagine that I, from where we were two weeks ago. Wow. Wow. The worst England team ever. Yep. Ball, Ballwick out here with his boring Imagine, ball, ball tactics. Imagine how many times they would have won it if Ben Hurley played 12. That's the one thing they've been lacking. Is ben he Hurley 12. would have led to four grand slams. Like... Bundy Arkey is the best male 12 in the world. Yeah. But only because we've not seen Ben Hill play there. Exactly. Exactly. 
if Ben Earl had been playing 12, right, they would have been the first England team to win the Doddy Weir Cup. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, they would have. Just undeniable. Undeniable. Yeah. yeah. Show me your proof. So I think that brings us to a close. Yeah. Um, Super Saturday. Nothing like it. 